Now, there's more than two life questions. The most important of the two questions is heaven or hell. Where will you spend eternity? Now, that's not the questions that I'm necessarily going to start with. But when I finish the message today, it will be evident that there's two choices. Heaven or hell. That's the question you have to ask for yourself. Today we're going to talk about the two questions of the disciples. If you turn to Matthew 24, I didn't write down all the verses. In fact, I had to get Debbie to change the slide because instead of putting verse 3, I put 23. And I noticed it when I was reviewing everything. And 3 does not, or 23 wouldn't have been a good starting point. But verse 3. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The question had come up. What had happened was, was Jesus had prepared them for life after the crucifixion. And he had told them all these things that were going to happen, but they didn't understand. Because, see, they were expecting King Jesus to be king then. And that's not what the plan was. Because what happened was, Jesus had to die to fulfill the prophecy, and then the kingdom is future. They didn't understand that. So what they were asking was, is, you know, the two questions. When will these things happen? And what will be the sign? That was the question. Many have tried to answer that. Many have tried to answer the question, when will these things happen? And when, and what signs are going to accompany it? The religious. If you look at the religious... I know pastors, don't know them personally, but I read about them, I hear about them, I laugh at them, that have predicted the end of the world, the second coming, the, all this stuff, it's going to happen this day, this hour, this minute. You read your Bible, the Bible says that the Son of, Man, or the Son of God Himself does not know the minute or the hour. But yet we have foolish people out there that say, well, I know when it's going to happen. I've, I've marked my Bible. I've looked at the calendar. I've done astrology. I've done whatever you want to call it. And I know when it's going to happen. Bull hockey. Did I say that in church this morning? Too late. Or, I know religious people. This week, is Christianity really real? Will Jesus really come back? I was with somebody the other day that uh, doesn't believe that Christ is coming back. Period. In fact, they don't believe Christ has even come yet. See how we can get things so turned around? And, and they're religious. They go to church every time the doors are open. But they don't believe it. The secular... One day we just won't exist anymore. Do you know anybody like that? Do you know people that say, there's no life after death. One day I'll just die and I'll go in the grave and that'll be it. Or, the one I laugh about a lot is, I'll come back and be a dog. That's reverse evolution. If you're going to be a dog, you'd have been a dog before you became a human. According to the secular according to scientists or I read last night last night a so called Christian it's a myth how can there be a hell or God how can there be a hell it's just a myth or Hell's not real. There's no fire in hell. 
churches. It's not a myth. Hell is real. Or life just happens. Scientists, global warming is going to destroy us. It, it's going to. But it's not going to be air conditioners. It's not going to be black rooftops. It's going to be fire coming from heaven the last day. That's what's going to destroy the earth. Or the Big Bang Theory. It's just going to blow up. It blew up to create it. It's going to blow up when it goes away. You know, we have these people in our church, in our associates, and in the science world that talk about all this garbage. No wonder we're confused. I'm not confused because I got this right here. I'm not going to back down. We all know it's true. I don't know if Dion's caught up with me or not because my slide sort of got out of order. It's my fault. I wrote this message. I started to tell you. I wrote the part of this message was the message that I had written for the Sunday that I was sick. But God didn't, God didn't let me stop there. So we're just going to keep going. We all know it's true. When will the kingdom be restored? When's God going to come back and restore his kingdom? The Bible's real clear. It says it's not for us to know. And he, Christ, said these things. He was lifted up while they were, as he was lifted up, uh, into heaven they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight this is, the, this is when Christ after the crucifixion after the resurrection Christ came and he sat down and he talked to his disciples he was seen over and over and over and over and over but then one day Christ goes in and he's sitting there talking to his disciples and that's when they ask him the question when's all this stuff going to take place and as he was talking to him, the Bible says that he was lifted up into the clouds. They weren't expecting that. Even though he had prepared them, they weren't expecting it. And he's received, and, and behold, two men in white clothing. Two men. Now, two men were angels. They were angels sent here by God to identify with Christ. The two angels... And the former men first appeared in Genesis. One appeared in the book of Genesis. And then an angel appeared at the tomb. Now, was it the same angel, same two? I don't have a clue, and I don't care. The Bible says it was angels, two men. And I accept the fact that two men in form of angels were standing there identifying this Christ. And what did they say? They said... The two men's clothing stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee. Only the apostles were the, were the Galileans. They were there. He was speaking to the apostles and others that were there. But he was identifying with the apostles. Why do you stand here gazing into the sky? I'm sorry. The hardest part of this message today was memory versus NIV. Because, in fact, several verses I'm going to quote directly from King James because that's how I learned them. And when I started reading them, I started getting confused. Not that the words were wrong, it's just I knew how I memorized them. Why do you stand here gazing in the sky, looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you will come again in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. They were standing there and they were saying, why are you wasting your time looking? That's really what they're saying. Why are you wasting your time looking? This same Jesus that is going up will come again. You better get busy and tell the world about Jesus. I really believe that's where they were going with it. But yet, what do we do? We look at what's happening 
and we sit and talk about our good things that happen. We slow down. We quit. Keep move. We got to keep moving forward. We got to keep going. Acts 1, 9 through 11 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. This was an echo of Daniel. This, is, this was prophesied in Daniel 7, 15. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. He's coming back. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back to set up his earthly kingdom. And the Bible says, even the ones that pierced him, even the ones that put him on the cross. Now, does that necessarily mean the Roman soldier? I don't, maybe. But I don't think that's where the emphasis is at. I think the emphasis on the ones that nailed him to the cross are the ones, the religious right. Because the religious right is who dealt, nailed Jesus to the cross. And they will have to look upon Jesus when he returns. And all the tribes of the earth, every nation, every person that's ever been born, every kingdom, the United States of America, the good, the bad, the indifferent, Everyone one day will look upon the risen Savior. All the tribes and will mourn him. The whole earth. All the people. That's not important. The secular people. The science people. The church people. That didn't really trust and believe who Christ was. They're going to have to look upon him one day and they're going to have to say, I made a mistake. Revela or, that was Revelation 1-7. Did we sing that song, Behold He Comes? I, I can't even think. There's a song. I, I, you know, a lot of times when I do my messages, because I was music for so much, Behold, he comes riding on a cloud. He's coming back. He'll be riding on a horse coming through the clouds. Now, is it a literal horse? I don't know. I think so. But I don't know. Because there's so much symbolism in the, in the Bible, just like the dry bones this morning. The symbolism of the dry bones. If you don't study your Bible, you're thinking that God brought together a bunch of dead people bones and took them out of the grave but that's not what the Bible says it says that he took dry bones and they ended up to glorify him is ultimately what happened that's what's going to happen one day is everyone, the Bible says that every knee will bow every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Matthew 24, 29 says, immediately, says immediately, and then verse 30 says that the Son of Man will appear in the sky. What's going to happen is one day when he comes back, it's going to be immediate. And he's going to appear. Are you ready? Is your faith real? Are you ready for Christ's return? The only way you can be ready is through salvation. Through accepting Christ. Is your faith real? I'm not talking about a hope so, think so, maybe so salvation. I'm not talking to somebody that, 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 made that profession because Billy did. Made that profession because their arm was twisted. I'm not talking about somebody that attends church every Sunday and don't have the heart knowledge. Because what happens is, is one day you're going to hold, be held accountable. You can know. Who are you following? Who 
are you really following? Are you following the world? Emotions? Family? Friends? I know people that say they got saved because Billy got saved. They've never darkened the doors of the church again. They've never opened their Bible again. I don't believe they're Christians. I'm sorry. But what happens is, is and it's the church's fault. It's the church's fault. Because we have vacation Bible school or we do these magnificent soul winning things and then we never follow up. We never do anything to encourage, to build, to edify. We got on that in Sunday school this morning. It's the church's fault. It's a personal decision. No one can make that decision for you. I would love, I would have loved when Debbie and I first got married to have, when my kids turned six years old, to guarantee their salvation by taking them up there and getting them baptized and all that good stuff. But they had to make that decision. They had to trust God, not Daddy trust God for them. But yet, over and over and over, we, have, we see this in, in ministry. Does the media control your emotions? These preachers on TV, health, wealth, and prosperity. The, the preachers that, that uh, uh, later in my message, I wrote down Jim Jones. Remember who Jim Jones was? He had all these followers in the name of God. And they all died. Maybe some of them were Christians. Maybe some of them were misled. But Jim Jones was misleading. God's going to hold him accountable for that. It's not always an emotional experience. I know people that have gotten saved and they've cried their eyes out for a week. I know people that got saved and never shed a tear. My emotions are different than someone else's emotions. But it is a changed life. You can't trust your emotions. When you get down to salvation, I mean, this is sort of... We're way off on slides. I'm sorry, Dion. You're number three. <laughs> That's okay. Is it? Are your emotions based on Korea, Islam, Russia, Black Lives Matter? Do you let those things control your life? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I get so emotional about that garbage that it just, I forget who I am. I'm being honest. I get aggravated. I get aggravated with this political garbage that's going on. I'm just sick of it. Sometimes I forget who I am. I apologize if I've offended anybody, but I do. Most time when you're Korea, Islam, Russian, Black Lives Matter, that's what your emotion, you're emotion. You're just searching for something. You're searching to fit in. You're not going to fit in. Are your emotions controlled by hunger? Bloods, tornadoes. What happened when 9-11 when got bombed? We had probably 65, 70 people in church that Sunday. Think about it. Was that an emotion? Was the world's coming to an end? We better get our act together. It lasted here for about four weeks. Some churches, it lasted for six. Okay? Some, maybe seven. But it was all based on emotionalism. We have people come to church because they're hungry. We always try to meet that need. We went, Debbie and I went, and took some, another couple from church from here ten years ago when... Uh, the, the hurricane in New Orleans hit. 
and went and worked. Built, rebuilt the house. Seemed like every church in the south went down there to help. But then what did we do? We went down there and did all this magnificent work and walked off, turned our back on it. Hadn't done anything since. Something happens again, we'll go again. But we come back and we talk about all the people that we led to the Lord. People will do anything to get a handout. People will do anything if you're going to build their house. People will do... Now, am I saying that we shouldn't go? No. What I'm saying is if we do go, we should follow up. If we do go, we should stay involved. Not just pat ourselves on the back because we've done this magnificent work. God's Word talks about all these things. When I was a kid, about eight or nine, my parents had a record, and I think we, Debbie said this morning we still have it. I didn't know we still had it. But it's an LP. Nobody, Bob, you had a record, you got a record player, right? I'm going to bring it to you, let you record it for me. No. The record was called Flight Final. You might have heard of it. But the, word, the flight final record was, is it was a story about the end of the world. And, 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 and it, it's, it's, it's done really well. And it talks about how this flight final is the Christians have boarded this flight. And they boarded this flight to heaven. And then as they're flying, the captain of the plain, who's Jesus Christ, is talking to them about what's going on in earth. And it's talking about the devastation of earth. It's talking about how this person's in heaven, but this person's wife is still on earth because she hadn't made that profession. It's talking about the wrecks, how People are driving their cars, and one's called up. They leave because the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those that are alive and remain will be called up in the moment in a twinkling of an eye. And it's given a picture of the resurrection. It's given a picture of how because we're Christians... One day, we won't be here no more. Families broken, broken, children gone, parents still there, officials gone, wrecks, fires, plane crashes. Flight final didn't crash. But the story is, is the way this is written is, is you have a Christian airplane pilot, and he's flying across the country, and all at once, the rapture happens. And, and that pilot leaves the cockpit and there's nobody there to fly the plane. Think about it. Because one day it's going to happen. This will be the resurrection of the church. We're going to go back to the very first part of my message. What are the things? These are the signs in the last day. That's what the Bible says. And I, I had to break this stuff down so I could get it on the slide for you. It says, For many will come in my day saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead you. In the last days, I believe before the rapture of the church, you're going to have people come and say, I'm the Christ. Do you remember when Obama became the president. Many church leaders were calling Obama the Antichrist. Now, it didn't fit Scripture. It didn't fit the Bible of what the Antichrist would be, but the church was calling him the Antichrist. You remember that? I do. I, I, read, I even said something about it one day. Many you come and say, I'm he. I'm the one. 
there's already such confusion and the Christian is still here. We're already facing that stuff. You will be hearing wars and rumors of war. How many heard the news Thursday and then Friday and then again yesterday? Korea's got its missile launched to us and they're getting ready to attack America. They've improved their weapon enough that they can attack America. Wars? We're already in war, right? We're all over the world fighting wars. And now we're talking about Korea attacking America. I'm not worried about it. God's in control. There will be famines and earthquakes. We had a bunch of earthquakes this year. Are people going hungry all over the world? Don't have enough food to feed their own family? Is it happening? Bloody? I like this part of the verse. It says that these are merely birth pangs. Now, pangs means pains. It's merely birth pangs. And what the passage is saying that all of these things that are happening is just the beginning. It could have said this is just the beginning of a kidney stone, sweetheart. Because <laughs> most women that say that they've had kidney stones say it's worse than having a baby. Okay? But what the passage is saying is all of this stuff is happening and it's just the beginning of the end. Because the end is definite. The end's going to happen. The Christian and the non-Christian believe this is directly to America. It's not in my notes, but I really believe partly this is to America. You'll be delivered to tribulation. Because we are getting ready to face no matter who's present, Jesus is still king. But no matter which political side you're on, we are in a war in our country. And we'll kill you. There are people in the United States, there are people all over the world that are being killed because they profess Christianity. And you'll be hated by all nations. Do you agree that Christians are hated by all nations? It's the beginning. Because of my name. Because we're Christians. That's what the Bible says, that we're going to be hated. Then it gets real sticky. Many will fall away. Many church setters pew setters, pew warmers will fall away because they're challenged because they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof many people that are in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday when the tough gets going they won't keep going they'll fall away that's what it's saying many will fall away and not only will they fall away, they'll, they'll betray the pastor. They'll betray the elder, the deacon. <laughs> I won't include deacons because a lot of them ain't got it right either. They will betray the people of the church, the faithful of the church. That's what's going to happen. I believe all of this will happen at the beginning of the tribulation. I believe it's going to happen before God calls us home. In many ways, I believe it's already happening. And they'll hate one another. I had this conversation yesterday. You can't be a Christian and hate. If you're a Christian, 
There's no room for hate in your makeup. Many will fall away believers, but may just have the heart, uh, a head knowledge. That's what this means, is, is you just got a head knowledge. You don't have a heart knowledge. False prophets will arise in the church. Do we know any? I can give you a list. False prophets. They have the charisma they're well, well educated. A lot different than your preacher. They, they, they dress in three-piece suits. And I'm not putting down three-piece suits. Don't, don't misquote me. Don't misunderstand me. But some people are led astray because of the size of the church, because of the, the well-spoken preacher, because of you just put your own thing there there are many that fall away there are many that think of one of the largest churches in the United States that doesn't even believe in salvation I know him I don't know him personally I, I listen to him I listened to the interview of him when he was asked what does it take to be a Christian and he couldn't answer it one of the largest churches in the United States. Couldn't answer what it took to be a Christian. He's misleading a lot of people. God's going to hold him accountable. This is where I wrote Jim Jones. Now, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. It's between you and God, not you and the preacher. I dealt with a Jehovah's Witness two weeks ago. Wayne Wells showed me a verse, and I can't quote it exactly, but the verse says that if anyone comes to you preaching a gospel that does not believe in the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, turn away from them. Jehovah's Witness are looking for Jehovah. They do not accept Jesus as Jehovah. Now I've researched it, I've looked at it, I've questioned it over and over and over. They are looking, the one the other day is looking for Jehovah to come back. I questioned it because of the one verse choose you this day who you will serve as for me and my house we will serve the Lord there says we will serve Jehovah now if Jehovah if Jehovah has not come yet and this is an Old Testament passage how are they serving Jehovah in the Old Testament False prophets. Lawlessness will increase. What's right's wrong, what's wrong is right. Most people's love will grow cold. Do we love our church? Is our love cold for the church? Is our church a convenient sal is salvation just for convenience? Is it your fire insurance and that's good enough for you? The Bible says, but that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. That's back to where these people are predicting he's coming back. And when they've already got it figured out, what time, what day, what year. Nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Remember Noah's story? Noah worked for hundred years I think to build his ark preaching every day trying to people to come every day every day every day every day when the ark when they got on the boat the ark closed and it was Noah 
and his sons and family. Not one soul. Not one person. For those days before the flood, they were eating. Are we eating? Are we drinking? Marrying? Giving in marriage? Are we doing every, Are we living life like we've always lived life? That's the point that this passage is making. Are we living a life to please ourselves? Until the day they entered the ark, Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand, not Noah, but the people that were in the water, people that were in the rain. They didn't understand what Noah had preached until the flood came and took them all away. There will be people sitting in this church that if they don't give their life to Christ and the Christ comes back, they'll die and go to hell because they didn't understand or they wouldn't make that decision or they thought it was too complicated. Many will not understand Christ's return until it happens. Um, took them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then there will be two men in a field, two people working side by side. One's gone, the other one stays here. Do we know people like that? Do we have people in our lives that we stand beside every day, that we talk to every day, that, that we spend time with once a week, that you know they're going to hell and you're not taking enough time to share with them? Do you? Shame on you. Shame on me, because I've, I've got people in my life that maybe sometimes I need to just step out there a little bit. Shame on you. Two working in the field. Next passage said there'd be two women grinding wheat. One to be taken, one to be left. It goes to another song. I wish they'd all be ready. I wish they had all been ready. That song goes, a man and wife sleep in bed. One called up, the other one stayed. Two people working together. One's called away. The other one's left behind. A man and a woman awake and their children are gone because they had enough sense to send them to church. Didn't take them, but sent them. Their children are gone. It's reality. It's going to happen. Do you have that security? But the one who endures to the end, the faithful, not moving, the true Christian, not the, and, and don't miss my point when I say Sunday morning Christian. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. What I mean by Sunday morning Christian is, is the person that's holy, holy, holy on Sunday morning. They don't pray. They don't read their Bible. They talk like the world. They live like the world. But on Sunday morning, they go put on their Sunday go to meet and close again. And they're all spiritual again. That's what I mean when I say Sunday morning people. We got them in every church. Who's going to endure to the end? He will be saved. He will be saved. He who endures to the end will be saved. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Can we agree that the gospel has been preached to every nation? Can we? I believe it has. I don't believe there's any place on earth that the gospel has not been presented. So what's that mean? That's part of the prophecy that's been fulfilled. That's part of the things that have to happen before the end. 
before Christ comes back. Abomination and desolation, which was spoken of through the prophet Daniel. That's the end. In Revelation 13, let me put my glasses on. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him. It's the Antichrist. There's going to be people that de deceive the church, that deceive the Christian. Uh, to, that were given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast, who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. Now, I, I don't know. I know it's symbolism, but I believe that that's talking about sort of a resurrection, a temporary resurrection. Now, Ron, correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe that's a temporary resurrection. I believe that that's going to happen because people, you know, I can remember. I was seven years old. Eight years old. I can remember when John F. Kennedy was killed. And the church, the religious right, decided that John F. Kennedy was the Antichrist. I remember it. I can remember when Elvis Presley died that there were people saying that he was the Antichrist. Okay? Now, it doesn't fit Scripture, but why did they choose these people? They chose these people because of their fame, their charisma and how important they were to the world. So, if this scripture talks about that and, and, you, and you take it literally, John F. Kennedy, not John F. Kennedy, but you understand what I'm saying? Kennedy could have been resurrected as the Antichrist. Do you understand where I'm going? Now, I don't believe that it's Kennedy. I don't believe it's Elvis. I don't believe that... I don't know. I know another group that believes that the Catholic Church is the Antichrist. Well, that doesn't fit Scripture either. But it's being taught. It's being portrayed. The image of the beast who the wound had soared and has come to life. And it was given to him to give life so the image of the beast would speak and cause many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Hmm? Oh, the devil's trying to mess me up? That's all right. I don't care. Twenty years ago. Longer than that. Thirty years ago. Deb and I went to a Easter show where it talked about where they were presenting the end times. And, and it was graphic. It was done by a church in Georgia. And they loaded you in this wagon and took you in the middle of the woods. And, and when you got in the middle of the woods, they unloaded you out of the wagon and you had to walk down this trail. And on that trail, the first thing that happened was 20, four or five big monster trucks, lights blaring, mufflers taken off, come racing towards you. And they've got their guns drawn. And they're shooting. And they're talking. And they're yelling. And they're shooting people in the audience. And it's scary. And the whole time is, 
You believe in God. You believe in God. It's happening. Then it got more gruesome. What may really happen in the last days? Where people turn away from natural things to unnatural things because of starvation. Because of life. Where people take their parents in this demonstration and kill them because they're Christians. It's reality. Because the Bible says that we will turn against each other. Family against family. It even says believer against believer. Now, there's a fine line there what the believer says. It's going to happen. Desolation. Whoever's on the housetop must not go down. What that passage is saying is don't look back. Don't look back. Who's ever in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. Run. But woe to those who are pregnant and those that are nursing in those days. I had to really think about that one. Woe to those that are pregnant. If the world is out of control and you're having a baby, what is your thought process? If the world's out of control and you're nursing your baby and you're worried that somebody might grab your baby and sacrifice it, that's what that's talking about. Luke 23, 29 says, For behold, the days are coming where they will say, Blessed are the barren and the womb that never bore and the breast that never nursed. That's talking about the end. That's talking about what's going to happen. Next says, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter. Hard travels happen in the wintertime. It's real hard to get place to place. Or on the Sabbath. Why is that the Sabbath? What is the religious rite? What do they preach? What do they do? What do they say? Can't work on Sunday. You can only carry your cloak so far. You can only walk this far or you have to back up. You have to stop. Why is it saying the Sabbath? Because what will happen in the last days these people will still be trying to press their people into submission to what is believed. I'm going to hurry. I, got, I don't think I'm going to finish. I'll finish this slide, then we'll, go, we'll, we'll close in prayer. Then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now. We think we have trials now. We think that we are suffering now. Hey, we're in America. We got it made. I can't remember her name. But there's a lady that became a Christian that has been in jail going on five years now because she will not denounce her faith. She had one baby just before she went in jail and was pregnant when they arrested her 
and had that baby in jail and that baby is being raised by a Muslim father and she is still in jail five years such as not not anything nothing like it God's wrath will be poured out on the world the unsaved these who denied and worse if you've been taught it's going to be worse on you if you've been taught but yet you denied Christ it's going to be worse on you Unless those days had been cut short, if God had not intervened and showed His mercy already and sent His Son, that's what it means, they were cut short because of His Son, no life would have been saved. If Christ came to save the world, if He hadn't come, there would be no hope. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Because you're the elect, because you're a Christian, you're not going to have to go through the end of this. I believe you're going to have to start with it. Anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, and there he is, do not believe him. It's the Antichrist. False Christ, false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. That means that we're missing if you're really the elect. Deception won't get us. It's not possible. If you're a Christian, not just a follower, not just a head knowledge. I'm going to close with that because I've got two more slides. This message is for the Christian but it's also for the non-Christian. See, one day, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What that means is, is whether you do it here on earth while there's still time, or whether you do it afterwards you're going to do it a much better place to do it is here on earth because if you choose not to do it here on earth the most horrific part of it is hell you will burn in hell where the fire is not quenched and the worm doesn't die that's what the Bible says. I'm one that believes when the tribulation comes that you've lost your opportunity. But you're going to live through the tribulation. You might die part of the way through it. And, and let me qualify it too. The tribulation happens this year, next year, three years from now this congregation would probably live through the tribulation. If it happens 30 years from now, you're just going to have to live through the tribulation that's on earth right now. But one day, you're going to face Jesus, our God. And Jesus is going to say there and say, Father, I died for him. I died for her. Or, Jesus is going to say, depart from me. Enter into the gates of hell. It's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment.